Yeah. If you're telling me it's cool to drink with you, but then the next day you're going to give me the third degree, I'm going to go back to being a recluse and drink alone in my room. Yep. Or go do something stupid. Um, like get in trouble with the Russian mob, which I did. You know, like on Thanksgiving of all times. Where you are now may not be where you came from. The choices you make today may spiral out of control or spin you in the right direction. Discover a riveting, true story of how Carlos Vieira nearly destroyed his life and lived to tell about it. Stand up, stand firm, believe, make it happen, and live through the madness. Knocking doors down along the way. And don't miss others telling their powerful stories on our podcast. Visit kddmediacompany.com. Brother, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for having AJ me. AJ here with us. AJ, We've appreciate been it. Been shooting the shit, and uh, yeah. fans of the podcast, of course, uh, followed your career. We're roughly the same age, and so uh, how is everything treating you? Obviously, pandemic put pandemic put not only tour on hold, family stuff. Um, uh, you know, the pandemic for me was uh, biggest blessing I think I've ever had in my life. Really? Um, you know, we. We were, we were wrapping up our South American leg uh, last March. Yes. Um, we had one last stadium left in Sao Paulo, and uh, the government was like, can't let you do it. All right. Things are getting worse. So we flew home on the 13th of March. Three days later, lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, and prior to that, um, I... My sobriety date is December 18th, 2019. And I, um, you know, had my one last hurrah in Vegas, of course. Um, you know, for, for, a, for a brief, brief period, I had built up this resentment towards my wife, who I have no business having resentment towards. She has every ounce of reason to have resentment towards me. But um, I asked her to come with me to see, um, <clears throat> it was Shania Twain's opening night. She's oh, been a okay. long, long time friend. And she was back and forth, back and forth. And I'm like, I really, I think it'd be a great date night. Let's get away from the kids, just one night. And she just wasn't feeling it for whatever reason. So I said, well, I kind of feel you know, obligated to go because I've already said I would go. And she's been to our show multiple times. And that was, that was my demise. Me going solo to Vegas, obviously already on the, on the flight over, I'm texting right. my dealer. Everything is lined up. And per usual, I thought I could sober up by the time I got home, but I never stopped. Mm -hmm. So I smelled like a bar um, when I got home. And my youngest daughter, uh, I mean, both my kids have saved my life, but my youngest daughter was really the one that kind of put the nail in the coffin for me. Um, when I sat down next to her on our living room couch, she normally is all about cuddle time. And she started, and then she backed up, and she said, you don't smell like my dad. And that huh. fucking crushed me. So called up Renee. I said, dude, I'm done. He's like, all right, I've heard this countless times. He's like, you know, a mutual friend of ours um, was actually celebrating her third birthday, um, she went back to the sober living that she was at to get her cake. And he said, why don't you meet me there? Let's, let's give our friend a cake for, yeah. her, for her three years, and then let's have a chat. And I was still hung over like a son of a bitch. And he could see the desperation, I think, in my eyes. So he said, all right, well, you know, tomorrow, why don't you come to my house and let's have a conversation. And, uh, be there at six, and I showed up at 5.15. I'm always early to everything. Uh, even when I was hungover, I was the first one downstairs, first one on the bus. Same, but I hate being I, I, I can't stand being I late. hate being I late. was not that reliable. But, but sidebar, it, it pissed me off because, a, not all, but some of the bandmates of mine are very late. <laughs> like very, very rudely late. And they know who they are. Um, <laughs> Mainly just one. But uh, so not only are they an hour late, but I'm 30 minutes early. Mm -hmm. So to me, they're an hour and a half right, late. Right, sure. Right. So 
So anyways, back to, uh, you know, I had stayed sober going back on the road to South America. Mm -hmm. um, and I was back in the gym. I was working out. I was, we have a thing on the road called the Breakfast Club, which is, you know, a couple of my bandmates, our security, they go down every morning for breakfast, complimentary breakfast. I would never, I was always invited, but I would never show up. Then they stopped inviting me. Now I'm down there every morning, first one down there, hey, welcome everybody. And everybody was shocked. Like, yeah. Okay, he's doing good because he's down here every morning. He's in the gym every morning. And uh, so once the lockdown happened, a bunch of friends of mine and I started a Zoom, you know. God, I'm sure we all here wished we had invested in Zoom. Yeah, yeah. no shit. Before, right. <laughs> before it went public. That and GameStop. God. Or uh, Roblox. Yeah. Um, I do have shares in Roblox, but not pre-IPO. That, that was oh. literally impossible. I, I'm yeah. guessing as a father myself that yeah. the kids are on that Roblox Bill shit. Bill Gates like... couldn't even get in pre-IPO. So what makes me think I <laughs> right. um, So we literally, every day since March 16th at 4.30, we have a Zoom meeting. We call ourselves Circle the Wagons. Nice. And which ironically was going to be the podcast name. Really? Before it became pretty messed up. But. And uh, for whatever reason, it just, you know, iHeart wasn't sure about it. And, you know, our amazing producer, Amy Sugarman, was like, oh, I think we can beat it. Keep that for your personal. And I'm like, all right, cool. Sure. And then I'm the one that came up with pretty messed up because all three of us are pretty messed up. I mean, <laughs> look, even though we're sober, you're still pretty messed up. Oh, yeah. It's like you're never going to be your average Joe yeah. and you know, but that's what makes us unique. Yes. You know, it makes us special. Yes. Um, another sidebar, my wife and I are rewatching Shit's Creek. Oh, show. love I just Shit's fucking Creek. started it. Love and, Shit's and Creek. And it's funny, like when you rewatch a show, you pick up things that you never saw. Oh yeah. And Moira had a quote last night that I know for sure I did not hear. When we watched this the first time, I wasn't sober. So that's probably a lot to do with it. I'm really hyper-focusing now. Yeah. And she said, miracles don't take reservations. Huh. And I'm like, I'm getting that tattooed. That is brilliant. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Because, you know, especially in our world, you wait for that miracle. Yeah. And that miracle does come if sure. you do what is suggested. Yeah. And, but I love that. Like miracles yeah. don't take reservations. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, I'm getting that, I'm getting that ink somehow, some way. Yeah, like, it kind of gave me chills. The irony of that, like when you're talking about that is like for me to end up in this job, you know, I did radio for 20 years and, uh, and I always had this belief of doing something bigger and not, not that I wasn't successful on a smaller scale within that career field, but just something where it felt better in here. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, yeah. bumping into like the book we gave you, Carlos Fierro's autobiography, and he kind of told me about that. And, oh, you do these podcast things, too. What? Talk to people about sobriety. Like, okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, and here we are, what, 16 months later, yeah. sitting down with you, you know, talking well, about this stuff. That's the thing, stuff. is like, when we started the podcast, you know, we started it during the season when I was doing Dancing with the Stars. Right. So obviously, a lot of our guests were contestants on the show trying to get the numbers up to, to, you know, just out of the gate. But then once the show was done, we went to what we really wanted to be talking about, which is recovery and mental, mental health. Mm -hmm. And that's, mental health to me has always been the elephant in the room. And now it's much more spoken about. It's much more um, taken seriously yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, because, you know, you, I, I don't, I, I, I'm, I try not to watch the news daily because it's never anything good. Um, you know, unless I'm watching Grandpa Joe, then I'm gonna, you know, definitely watch it because I just love that man. Um, and the most amazing vice president. Uh, but, you know, you read these articles and it's like a, another mass shooting and this right. and that. But the one constant that's in every article, that's in every news broadcast is so-and-so suffered from mental health. Yeah. And, at first I was like, are you just throwing that out there to excuse this person's actions? Or do you really know what mental health issues really are sure. and where they stem from? Because a lot of people, I don't think really understand. No. Now more people are getting educated. Shows like this, shows like our show are educating people. And 
that's what I love is that now it's it's not the elephant in the room anymore because it can't be. Yeah. You know, there is so many people out there that that do struggle with mental health. They don't have to necessarily be addicts. Mm -hmm. They could be depression. Sure. It could yeah. be anxiety. You know, uh, it could be body dysmorphia. Whatever it is. All of it. That's all mental health. Yeah. You know, so. I mean, we've been blessed to have some amazing guests on the show. Still pissed that Deepak wouldn't tell me my mantra, but it's okay. He, yeah. did, he did tell Renee back when Renee was with his ex-wife. Um, they all were hanging out, and he whispered in Renee's ear what his mantra is. And he, he's, we've been best friends for 21 years. And he, he still, still won't, won't tell fucking me. tell you. I'm like, it's not like it's gonna go yeah. away. Yeah. If yeah. you tell me, just <laughs> tell me. Yeah, Cheryl was giving a shit like, oh, you guys have had some really awesome guests. It's like. Fucking so have you guys got Deepak on there. Deepak and I mean. But speaking of uh, when you talk mental health, let's kind of jump back for you um, because, you know, we, we've really talked about it. We've had some great guests, and especially one lately, I, a guy I'm sure you'd love to talk to, Dr. Rob Kelly, who worked with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, trauma as the gateway drug. Mm -hmm. So my understanding for you is mom, dad separated pretty early mm -hmm. on. Um, you know, my dad addiction, um, some other things in there too that I know for me, still now at roughly the same age as you, unraveling the shit finally. And, you know, it's yeah, like. I mean, for me, you know, I, I never really dealt with the quote unquote abandonment issues. Sure, okay. Um, you know, I, because I had a great upbringing. I had, you know, my, was my, my mom and my grandmother and my grandfather living in a three bedroom apartment. Um, my grandmother was my life. She was everything to me. Um, took me to all my auditions, picked me up from school, introduced me to the Golden Arches. <laughs> uh, my grandmother worked and my mom worked. And, you know, but I never really asked questions about where's dad, whatever. I saw him once when I was around 12, uh, around Christmas time, and then I didn't see him again um, until I was around 17. The girl I was dating at the time, um, so my grandfather would stop by the studio and give me mail because I had moved out when I was 17. Got in a huge fight with my mom, said I'm moving out, and I moved in with my 15-year-old girlfriend at the time. And our previous manager paid for our you know, rent, and it was a weird situation. Very, very cats in the cradle, it's a whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and my girlfriend at the time took it upon herself to find my dad's home address because I guess it was child support, something was coming in it and it wasn't being paid. Um, so she just surprised me one day and we drove to this random house and she's like, why don't you go knock on the door? I'm like, where the, where the fuck are we? Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it was my you know, dad. And he had been keeping up with my career. Do you know who he was right away? I knew. Yeah. I mean, we look, I think we look more alike than my mom and I, but then again, my mom and I do have a lot of similar features, but. Mm -hmm. Um, I get my balding from my dad, thank you so much. Um, going for my second hair surgery end, end of next month. Um, no shame in that, fellas, by the way. No, nah, do that. Um, you know, it, it, it kind of felt natural at uh -huh. first. And then my stepmom kind of came over the top and was like being really aggressive, like trying to get us to really bond and all this stuff. And she pushed me away. And then she tried to be my mom and she mentioned something to me on the phone one time and I was like, you know what? I don't need this shit. I'm out. And then I didn't see my dad again for 15, 20 years. And then he reached out to my now wife on Facebook and he showed up my third and final time in treatment uh, during family week. And it creeped me out because when we were in family therapy, it was just me and him and like, we're sitting on the couch. I'm not looking at him. My family therapist starts crying. And I'm like, what's going on? She's like, I just can't believe what I'm seeing. And I'm like, what are you seeing? She's like, look at yourselves. Every little mannerism was identical. The way we were sitting, the way we were twiddling our freaking shirts, the way we blink. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna sit differently. No, 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 I'm not gonna be you. I'm not gonna be you. Um, but, you know, during, the all these years in and out of the rooms any stretch of sobriety i would start to kind of jump ahead in the steps um 
you know, to everyone's favorite step, the fourth step. All right. Um, and then I would jump ahead to my ninth step a little bit and slowly start making amends because it's like, you know what? Water under the bridge. Right. He didn't directly do anything to me. Mm-hmm. What happened was between my mom and my dad. I was just in the way, you know? Um, and then my mom and I had finally had conversations years later and she's like, yeah, you know, he did try to reach out. I kept letters from you. We had our arguments. My mom mm. and I didn't speak for a year. Yeah. Um, but now everything, like I talked to my dad probably once or twice a month um, and things are better. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're, they're not softball in the front yard. I don't think it's ever going to be that. Plus I can't throw for shit. <laughs> um, but it's definitely better. Yeah. And I think, you know, the better I get, the better I can see situations for what they are. And I can weed out what I don't need in my life. And I can embrace what I do need in my life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and back to one of the first questions you said, like I said, the pandemic has been my silver lining because being off the road, not being in those tempting situations, sure. a meeting a day, every day, religiously. Um, I talk to Renee five, six times a day. You know, best friend, mentor, has helped me immensely in my recovery. I, I talk to a lot of my sober buddies daily. Yeah. And just being home and being being a, a good husband and being a, a great father, it's just it's just and and finally really doing the work. Yeah. Yes, I'm still on my four step. I've been on it for a year. <laughs> I'm getting to it, but I know you know. Renee suggested to me, which I think is great, and I know he's right. He said, "Promise yourself that you'll at least get your fourth step done before you go back on tour." I- everything will change. And I could see why he would say that. So, you know, and so, but the addict in my brain goes, okay, well, I've got till February, so I could start it like (laughs) mid-December. No, I I wanna, I do wanna get it done. I don't wanna rush it, but I do wanna get it done. Because I've never done it. Most people relapse on their four step. You've never done your inventory, huh? Never. Yeah, for those that may not know the four step, yeah, Yeah. it's it's inventory. Fearless moral inventory. Yep. It's and, tough. And like the sex inventory and all of these oh. things, it's just like, I That's a tough one because for me, I know that was a big area because of what I went through with childhood. Mine does surround a molestation issue, heavy exposure to pornography at an early age. And I had to really kind of take a look and, you know, yeah. I've realized that a lot of those things that happen have molded me and I no longer hate them though. Mm-hmm. I've kind of yeah. accepted them. And like you said, pretty messed up. Just, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's there. Yeah. Well, I can relate to what you were saying as far as, you know, you had a great upbringing and it just happened. That was the same with me. My parents were and are great. And I just fell into it. We were just out and about partying. That's what we did. I started drinking at probably like 14, 15, but cocaine hit the scene for me about 18 or 19 because I was be able to get into this bar. A friend of mine was the bouncer, so he'd always let me in and some guy had it. We were out in the parking lot and then it just happened. And then when I went to rehab for it, people were like, what are you running from, brother? What are you hiding from? I'm like, nothing. Have you ever done coke? It's a fucking blast. Yeah. Like, I'm not running from anything. <laughs> yeah. And that's, it's a common misconception that, well, you probably had a rough upbringing. That's why you do drugs. It's like, not necessarily. No. I mean, sometimes for a lot of people, yeah. But for me, no. My parents were great. Yeah, Taught I mean, me everything. Like, but You know, Cheryl, I'm sure she told you, like, yeah. her trauma yep. with that, you know, she dealt with. Yeah, but- yeah. For me, like, like same, like I, there was no trauma really. Okay, the abandonment, fine. That, to me, did not drive me to pick up my first drink or drug. Mm-hmm. I didn't start drinking until I was twenty-five, oh, wow. really drinking. Yeah. And but it grabbed me like a freak hook, line, and sinker. Hit the ground running. And you know, it started with sambuca, and then. Drank an entire bottle of that one night on the road, got alcohol poisoning, that was out. Uh, and then I found Jack. Jack was my best friend. And even though it was the most disgusting, oh, <laughs> it's so big, gross. And I would do it straight. I never do it on the rocks, never chilled, just shot, shot, shot. And chase it with something, but it was that burn. It was that feeling there. And I was like, oh, okay, now I got it. And then... An old friend of mine, no longer friends, um, introduced me to Coke the night of our video shoot for the, the uh, video, The Call. 
Hmm. And it was a night shoot. So my call time was like 2.30 in the morning. So he had it, and I was like, I don't know, man. I've heard horror stories. He's like, look, you don't have to, but it's here if you want it. And I'll never forget, I was staying at the Lermitage Hotel over off Burton in Beverly Hills. And the keys that they have for the rooms are like a normal key, but it's like the perfect rectangle with grooves. And you just put it in and turn, and it opens your door. And then I'm like, damn, this is like the perfect setup. Like it's, and it's wide, it's a good little, you know. So I did one in each nostril and nothing, nothing. I'm like, well, that's uneventful. And I said, should I do more? And he's like, no, 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 that's, you did a lot your first time. Give it a minute. So no sooner do I get in the makeup chair that it hits me. And I'm telling the makeup artist, I'm telling Kevin's wife, I'm like, I'm on fucking blow, guys. It's fucking awesome. What's going on? Oh, it wasn't a secret then. Ever it was like Well, no, was... I, I I told Kevin's uh-huh. wife, uh-huh, swore her to secrecy. Uh, got you. Okay. Nobody knew. And I then once I once me and Coke became friends, like I I found out that one of my closest buddies back in Florida was a was a fucking dealer. So I'm like every day. Insane. I, I fucking OD'd once. It was a straight Pulp Fiction moment. Adrenaline needle Middle, and all. Yeah. Full on deal. Um, it's a long story. I won't get into it. But it was insane to like wake up okay. with a fucking thing in my chest. I was like in my house. Yeah. But I'm just like, and you think that, that would stop me? Mm-hmm. No. All right. But, you know, I, yeah, it was insane. And I was doing like an eight ball a day on my own. So I, yeah, my tolerance was insane. Fucking shit. Um, and then like most alcoholics, we think, okay, I'm starting to feel a little bit drunk. I'm going to do some blow. Mm-hmm. Now I'm awake, which means I'm sober. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, you're not. You're just more fucked up. Yeah. It's like, big misconception. It's pretty messed up. It's pretty messed up. <laughs> you see what I did but, there? Oh, I like yeah. But yeah, I, I literally kept telling myself that I'm sobering up now. Because I'm alert. It's that fucking not- trap up here, oh, right? Dude. It's like the yeah. shit we tell ourselves. Oh. Yeah, no, that was, uh, you know, like you just said, I'm getting drunk, I need to do a line, because I would never do coke without alcohol. I did it right. once, and it just, it, 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 was, it was a different high. It was weird. I'd always have to have alcohol, but yeah, I was telling Cheryl, too, like, yeah, it like sobers you up. Well, it didn't sober you up, but you feel sobered up, but you just feel like on top of the world and like you could drink so much more than you right. could without it. And that's, that was mine. But then you have to do more blow exactly. to, you know. It was yeah. a vicious cycle. Balance you out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I thankfully, when I got sober the first time for like almost seven years uh, is when Oxycontin really blew up. Mm. And I was an upper guy. Like I didn't like any kind of downers. I wasn't into, I, I to this day, Weed always made me throw up. I could never smoke it because I'm sadly I still smoke cigarettes. So I would smoke a joint like a cigarette, and it would just just too much, yeah. and I'd be like, Ugh, you know. But I, uh, it's just crazy to me. Like you know, as we all know, when you relapse and it's been any length of time, for whatever reason, we pick up where we left off, and. When I tried to pick up where I left off with the drugs is when I ended up ODing. Mm-hmm. So like it was Because that tolerance just, drops. Oh, yeah. You think you can handle it, but oh, that's yeah. how, you know, a lot of people die when yeah, they, yeah. you know, relapse because it's like, well, I used to do this, so I'm gonna get back to where I started. Exactly. Nope. I mean, no, I was a chronic okay. relapser. I countless times I've relapsed. I can't even remember how many times. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and my my wife, God bless her, she was in Al-Anon, and you know, she still dabbles with it a little bit, but she understood in the beginning, okay, relapse is kind of part of the deal. That doesn't have to be for everybody, but don't beat yourself up. Yeah. If you survive it, don't beat yourself up. Mm-hmm. Just get back on the horse. But when it became an ongoing thing where she would be disappointed, yes. It was the lying about relapsing. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I didn't realize uh, when I got off Jack, vodka became my new thing, flavored vodkas. And I didn't realize that I was allergic to potatoes, which I didn't also know make vodka. (laughs) So we'd be on FaceTime. I'd be on the road. I'd be 
three seats to the wind, but I could talk normal, thinking I'm getting through and I'm, you know, she's not picking up on any signs, but my whole face would be breaking out and be red. I didn't see this and she didn't tell me because why, why give me another out? Yep. So she's like, okay, so now I'm picking up on this. Maybe tomorrow he'll be honest and he'll tell me. And no, I would lie and lie and lie and cheat and lie and cheat and lie and cheat in my mind, yep. you know, and not physically cheating. Let me clarify that. But I would lie because I thought, okay, I'm getting away with it. She, she was, she, she didn't yell at me. Everything was good. Yeah. But then she basically at one point finally hit her boiling point and like there was a talk of us separating. Mm-hmm. And even that didn't stop me. And again, you know, it took my my daughter. My kids, thankfully, though, have never, ever seen me drunk, and they never have to. Ah, uh, thank goodness. If I can stick this out and do what I'm doing now and keep to it, yeah. they never have to see me drunk. Yeah, yeah. I unfortunately cannot say that. Um, but with that said, it has spawned on my, my kids are on the verge of uh, 13 and 12. And... And their mother and I um, have openly talked to them about these things and our downfalls with substances and the bad choices that it's had us make. So we've done what we could to turn it into a positive right. and a conversation and education because I I'm mean. I'm doing that now with, with my oldest. I don't think she really grasps it yet. She's eight, but sure. like the other day, uh, I had this giant glass water bottle in our refrigerator and I pulled it out and I was drinking it with my uh, breakfast. And she's like, Daddy, is that alcohol? And I'm oh, like, wow. no, babe, it's water. She's like, but why is it in an alcohol bottle? I'm like, because so right after I explained to her as much as I could about alcohol, we went to Vegas for nationals, the biggest dance competition there is in the States. And because my daughter was in, was in the uh, competition. And she, like, everywhere she looked, there's people with bottles, people with alcohol, smoking, right. and alcohol, smoking. And then she, like, told my, my wife and I, she's like, Vegas is gross. I hate it. <laughs> All the alcohol. Like, everyone's dressed inappropriate. And I'm like, God, well, I Vegas hope that sticks. Gross. <laughs> Vegas is gross. All Vegas is it's disgusting. But, but I hope that she keeps that, like, right. everyone's dressed inappropriate thing. I hope that lasts yeah. well yeah. into her 30s. You're right, sweetie. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, everything's it is inappropriate. The grossest shit. Never dress like that. Yeah. But now it's like, uh, like she saw a photo. We just finished our Christmas album photo shoot. And because uh, we're doing our very first ever Christmas album. We've yeah. never had one in 28 years. And one of the photos of me was in between shots. So my eyes are like, you know, I look, whatever. <laughs> and she goes, Daddy, are you drunk? I'm like, oh my God, no. I'm like, sweetheart, just know Daddy doesn't drink. Daddy's not going to drink. If God forbid Daddy does drink, he will tell you. Yeah. So you don't have to freak out and like think anything that's glass is, is you know, alcohol or if daddy's eyes are caught between photos that I'm drunk. Right. Or so, you know, get a sinus but, attack or some oh, other yeah. shit. Well, I've or got whatever. the worst allergies in the world. And like I, I had surgery for it actually because uh-huh. I had so much blockage and I don't know. I, I, I'm going to attribute a lot of it to the blow. Sure. I think definitely helped. Yeah. Um, so much blockage that was back to like the, the back of my skull and they had to put the balloons in there and like take everything oh, out. Fuck. And I don't get them as much now, but when I do get an allergy attack, I'm done. Like I'm, my, my eyes, I can't open my eyes. I'm sinus headache. And yeah, I look stoned basically, yeah. but I'm not. But, I, but what I do think is endearing is that she's conscious of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she's aware of it, even though it's not always in the right context. That's okay, mm-hmm. you know. She's eight. I get it, you know. But hopefully, you know, she's saying this now, like, "Oh, I don't ever want to drink alcohol. I don't ever want to get tattoos. I don't ever want to smoke. I didn't want to do any of that either. <laughs> None of it." You well, know, the fucking club. Huh? It's like, but you know, my wife's tattooed. I'm tattooed. Yes, I smoke, but you know. Again, I was a late, late bloomer. 5150 is power. The power to overcome. The power to persevere. The power to set your life on a course for success. When you're faced with the challenges life throws at you, 
You focus and do what is needed to go beyond what is required. So stand up, stand firm, believe, make it happen, and live through the madness knocking doors down along the way. We are 5150. Even traveling the world, starting at 15 years old, I never had any desire to pick up a drink. I just didn't. Well, you were busy too. I mean, did you busy, have the time yeah, to even do it? Busy, but like, you know, I was hanging out with older girls. Oh, okay. But still, I just, I thought it was gross. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, you know, Same. that should have been the first red flag. Well, if you Same. think it's gross now, you're probably going to love it later. Yeah. Yeah, I can, re you know, I can relate to that. It's funny. I it took me right back to a situation where I was with this lady that I was really interested in in high school, and this is after high school, and I'm at her apartment, and her and her. Her friends are sitting there, you know, drinking and someone was smoking weed and stuff like that. And, and she was really interested in dating me. I'm like, I will never date anyone that drinks, or, you know, because I'm still so hurt by the shit my dad did. Exactly. Uh, you know, fast forward a year and a half and it's like, somebody needs to drive me home. I just puked, please. So it's, 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 all the weed gets smoked. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I swore I would never like I quit smoking for a year. And this was back in 98. And, uh, and I told my girlfriend at the time, like, you need to quit. I don't want to be around you. And if you do have a cigarette, here's some Tic Tacs. I can't even smell it. And then we broke up. And the day we broke up, I was like, she left a pack of Newport <laughs> on the kitchen counter. I'm like, mm, yeah, all right. And still, sadly, smoking, but significantly less. I do wish to quit sometime soon. Though. So jumping back, how, how would you tell your kids to not get tattooed being so tattooed? Because I, I don't have any kids, yeah. but I, I might one day. Yeah. And how the fuck am I going to tell them? Well, I mean, look, my wife and I have kind of put it to them like, it's your choice. You have to wait till you're 18. Of course. Number one. Of course. Um, but if you want to do it, I support you a thousand percent. I can't not. Mm -hmm. But if you don't want to do it, I support you a thousand percent. Right. You don't have to feel like you need to do it. And what I think is cute is now they're like getting these little like press on tattoos oh, yeah. to look like daddy and mommy. And it's awesome. Yeah. The one thing that I did that I was not, I was not cool with. It's not happened in a while. Uh -huh. um, is we'd be at a restaurant and my oldest would take her straw out and act like she's oh, smoking. Yeah. And I'm like, no, that you need to stop that now. Mm -hmm. Like, that is something I will not condone. Right. Yeah. Um, tattoos are fine. Piercings are fine. Smoking is not fine. Yeah. Um, you know, but As again, you know, she's like, she just dyed her hair for the first time. They both my girls did. And my oldest did purple, like right in the front and like on like the bottom of her hair. And the other day she like approached my wife and she said, do you think it's too much? Did I do too much? And my wife's like, no. I mean, do you love it? She's like, yeah, I do, but I just want to make sure it's not too much. So like my wife and I talked about this yesterday. It's like, do you think she's now going to not want to ever dye her hair again? Or she will. I'm like, whatever she wants to do, we're going to support right. it. But if she doesn't ever want to do it, that's okay. Um, Cause my wife can't dye her hair anymore. She's violently allergic. Oh, to uh, something called PPD, which is what makes black hair dye black. It's what makes hair dye hair dye. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, when when her and I first started dating, she had jet black hair. She's naturally blonde, and she misses her black hair, but she can never do it again. Mm -hmm. um, and now, being a mom, she's even though she's helped others find natural, organic ways to do it with no side effects that have the same allergy she does. She still won't do it. She's got PTSD from it. So, yeah. you know, just buy a wig. Fine, <laughs> fine you know, whatever. You can get really nice wigs, different colors, switch yeah. it up, it's fine. We can be purple tonight, orange, red, exactly. green, blue, don't exactly. matter. Yeah. You know, liven it up. Uh, so what was the point for you that was led you to your first go at getting sober? Um, so we were in, it was a black and blue tour. Uh, it was 2001, and we were in where was it? Uh, Boston, and we had a day off the day after the Boston show, and we were supposed to throw the first pitch out. Uh, it was the beginning of the season, Major League Baseball game, Red Sox. We we're going to throw the first pitch. So the night of the show, 
the day before, our manager said, hey, do you guys want to do this? And then, we, and then all, you know, we're like, oh yeah, let's go do it. That night, I got annihilated and woke up the next morning, got my wake-up call from our tour manager, and I said, you know what, I'm not going to go today. I'm good. I'm tired, hungover. I don't really feel like going. And he's like, well, you guys all agreed to go. I'll let you deal with your bandmates, but I'll let them know. So then Kevin, who's the oldest of us five, he calls, bitches me out. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to go. You guys can go throw the pitch out. What's the big deal Like, if I'm not there? He's like, because we all agree to do it. I said, well, I'm agreeing not to do it. So my room was set up where there was the, the main room door and then the bedroom door, which was double bolted. So he broke in the main room door, tried to break into the bedroom, but it was double bolted. He couldn't get in. We exchanged some words. Last thing he said to me was, I'll never trust you again, and you're dead to me. Fuck. So I basically said, all right, fuck you. Uh, I quit. So I called our manager, who was on the road with us. I said, I want out. Sue me. I don't care. I'm out. I don't deserve this. I'm going to leave. The boys had paid for a therapist to be on the road with me, which I literally only saw in catering every day. I never used her. I never talked to her. So she came to, to, to my hotel room with our manager and my security she said, look, you have two options. You can go home, see your mom. You know, she's going to probably enable without realizing it and try to be caregiving and, you know, help you out. Or you can go to rehab. And we call it door-to-door -door where you don't go home. You just go from wherever you are and go straight to treatment. So I was like, oh, fine. So I flew to Sierra Tucson in Tucson, Arizona. Uh... My sobriety date then was July 9th, 2001, and stayed there for 31 days and proceeded to stay sober for seven years. Um, first three years, I went to a meeting every day, and then that got less and less, less and less, less and less, but I had lost the desire to pick up and use. But now looking back, I was a dry drunk. You know? sure. I was white knuckling it, basically, you know, not knowing any little thing that really pissed me off or set me off could have easily gotten me to relapse, but nothing ever set me off. Mm -hmm. And then we were on the road, um, we were in Belgium, and it was a day off the next day, so after the show, everybody was getting lit. Nick and our previous security, who has now since passed away, uh, God rest you, Q, um, they got into a tiff. And I was like, I don't need to be here. This is stressing me out. I'm going back to my room. I just want to hang out with you guys. And you guys are being little bitches. <laughs> so I'm going back to my room. And I'm going to pop on a movie and whatever. So I pop on a movie. I open up my mini bar. And I'm doing the remote. And I'm doing this. And I grab a bottle. And I pull it out, thinking it's Coke. And uh, it was a Heineken. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I deserve it. I'm stressed out. I had maybe three or four sips, and then, sorry to say, didn't want to pay for it, so I peed the rest back in the bottle, squeezed the top back on, put it back in the mini bar. Huh. Uh, didn't get charged, by the way. <laughs> so, um, that would have been a lot of fans of yours. I'd be stoked for that, uh, had yeah, they had known. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> AJ's pissed. There are some, there are some, been some randos. Yeah, here, I'm sure. But, uh, <laughs> Shit. So I, I didn't pick up a drink for about four more months. And then was out at a party, had a full beer and a shot. Two or three months again, nothing. So I'm like, no shit. Maybe, cured. maybe I've, I'm fucking cured. Mm -hmm, yeah. I can do this now. And then probably right around Christmas time that same year, uh, I don't know what happened. Something just clicked. And I went to go pick up a six pack and I grabbed a bottle of fucking rum and polished everything off. And I was like, I want some blow. So I went through my phone, I found people and off to the races. Mm -hmm. And literally from that moment, so that would have been 2009. Um, from 2009 until 20 months ago, I've been on again, off again. I've, and, I, and I've been to treatment two more times after uh, Sierra Tucson. I went to Promises in Malibu twice. Mm. Um, and the last time I stayed for seven weeks, I did extended living. 
where I could come and go as I please, but I would breathalyze when I came back, mandatory five meetings a week. Um, but what amazing thing came from that is my first day going into extended care, uh, my wife picked me up, we went back to the house so I can get my car. Um, she's gonna hate me for saying this, but uh, we had sex because we hadn't seen each other in you know six weeks, or, nice. or at that time, four weeks. Um, and when my, when my oldest is old enough, I'm gonna show her the photo. But uh, before I left, my wife said, you know, is there anything you want me to get from the store for you to, when you get you know, home in two weeks? I, so I said, yeah, this, this, this. She goes, do you have any cash on you? I said, yeah. So I gave her $500 bills. And I said, you look so freaking beautiful right now. So she put a blanket over her, showed her shoulder, and she held the money up like I just paid her for. <laughs> Little did we know, in that moment was when we conceived my oldest daughter, Ava, now. Oh, nice. So, uh, awesome. and literally about a month out of treatment, we, 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 my wife and I went to get our nails done, and she broke the news to me. And she's like, you're not freaking out? I'm like, no. No, I mean, I think this is awesome. Yeah. And I stayed sober through the birth of my child and, you know, but then back on again, off again, you know, and it was just like. Is it the stress of getting out there on the road and being away from the family? And yeah, I think that that used to be my number one issue is how can I get away with it, like away from home? Um. And I would set myself up before, like on the, I, like five minutes after I walk out my front door in the car service to the airport, I'm already mapping out my first drink. Um, and, you know, I've traveled now twice on my own since I've been sober now. And that thought did not cross my mind. Awesome. And I'm like, wow, okay, this is, this is new, you know, because I, re I vaguely remember it when I was sober for seven years. But, like I said, I was white knuckling it. I just didn't care, um, you know. And we could all say, well, you know, had I done the steps then, had I done what was asked, I'd have what twenty something years sober today. But I don't. So what I do have is what I have now, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's all that matters is today. I don't know if I'm going to be sober tomorrow. I have no idea. Yeah. None of us do. Yeah. I have today. That's it. Just got to get through today. So during the time when you're traveling with your band and stuff and you were sober, were they cool about it? Were they supportive yeah. or did you just oh, yeah. like... They've been very supportive. I mean, they came to visit me when I was in rehab. A couple of them did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple of them had other obligations, which is fine. You know, their, their thing was, because they didn't really know how to deal with me when sure. I was out, yeah. was they, I think, were kind of deflecting in the sense of saying, well, you're not an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. You just don't pace yourself. Right, like, right. and if you're gonna drink, let's all drink together. Mm -hmm. So, okay, now I feel comfortable to drink with my bandmates, but I'm gonna drink like I drink, and then the very next day, I'm getting shit for it. Right. So then I'm like, well, then what the fuck? Like, yeah. if you're telling me it's cool to drink with you, but then the next day you're gonna give me the third degree, I'm gonna go back to being a recluse and drink alone in my room, yep. or go do something stupid. Um, like getting in trouble with the Russian mob, which I did, you know, like on Thanksgiving of all times, um, literally. <laughs> all right. Like, now we have to hear a story. Yes. I know you got to. Uh, you can't. So it's, <laughs> well, I got in trouble with the Russian mob. Thanksgiving. We were in. Um, it was either Russia or the Czech Republic, somewhere in that area, but it's all the same mob, yeah. pretty much. Um, I left Thanksgiving early. They flew a turkey out for us to have like an American Thanksgiving. It was all of us, our crew, um, and I was just like, fuck this, I'm going out and I'm gonna go get, get drunk. And we're in probably one of, in my, in, in, in my mind, like the most beautiful women in the world. There's gotta be some amazing strip clubs here. Like ungodly, beautiful women. And my security at the time and I find this one strip club. It's empty. The girls are gorgeous from what I can remember. And they were doing that 
deal where, you know, you get X amount of dances if you buy a bottle of champagne. Mm. So apparently I went through four bottles of champagne and then I went to use the restroom. I blacked out in the toilet. My security came to get me. He's like, okay, dude, we got to get you out of here. We got to go. So he's like, you got to go pay your bill. None of my credit cards worked. None of them. And the bartender's like, well, I, you, you can't leave without paying. And I'm like, what do you want me to do? My credit cards don't work. So he's like, well, there's ATM down the road. So we go to the ATM. He follows us. Doesn't work. So I'm like freaking out now. So he's got us in the car with another guy in the back with us watching us. Clearly, he's got a gun. He doesn't pull it out, but I know he's definitely strapped. So my security is like, look, I'll deal with this. Take me around. I'll take his cards. I need to get him back to his hotel. So we get me back to my hotel. The one dude waits outside the hotel for like five hours. And the hotel's like telling him to leave. And then he says something to them. And they like, oh, okay. So I call my accountants when it's, you know, morning time here. And I'm like, don't ask questions. I need $5,000. I was just going to ask what the tab was. <laughs> right now. It has to come now to this number. And they're like, okay, okay, okay. But I, it's going to take a few hours. I'm like, I don't have a few hours. I have a flight in a few hours. I need it now. So somehow, some way, my accountants got it within an hour and a half. They were not, they told my security they would not le let me leave the country. I would not be on that flight if I didn't pay the $5,000. So, best Thanksgiving ever. Uh, yeah. Was it good champagne? I doubt it. <laughs> I, I, it, was, it was like, champagne isn't good, anyways. Champagne's or, horrible. It makes my stomach hurt. Horrible, but, um, like, it's horrible. It's like know. mums. It's like the shit that was in the, the, the first Fockers movie. He's like, we got a lot of mums. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's the $2. So bad. <laughs> And I'm sure you don't remember the women either because, you know, four nope. bottles of champagne. No idea. Well, I have fuck, no AJ. Idea. I mean, <laughs> At I mean least I'm, assuming, got a story. I'm assuming <clears throat> they were pretty, but yeah. I, I have no idea. And yeah. I'm but assuming I mean, your security guard was like, fuck you, man. <laughs> I'm oh, I know. He's no By the way, after with this, us. I he's, quit. <laughs> well, so like it was his first time out there. Oh, ever. Geez. He's actually a professional DJ and he's crushing the game right now. And that's what his real love was. But he uh, was a friend of one of our security and we were down a guy. So he's like, you know, just come out. You and AJ, you're, you're both tattooed up. You both smoke. You guys are going to get along great. And we did. But he didn't know how crazy I could get. And obviously neither one of us knew where that night was going to lead. Sure. And it's like, uh, are you fucking hazing me or something? Is this a uh, joke I mean, or is this just you? <laughs> Both, probably, <laughs> um, in retrospect. Uh, yeah, I, um, you know, I definitely put a lot of people in danger a lot of, a lot, a lot of times. Mm. I think probably the funniest one I did was in, was it New Zealand? I think, yeah. Um, me and a bunch of fans went to get something to eat, and we walked down to the harbor, and we're like, hey, let's go skinny dipping in the harbor. And like me and like five girls just strip down naked and jump in the harbor. And a, a, a like a Paul Blart guy comes over. He's got <laughs> nothing, not even a taser. And he's like, hey, you can't get out of there. And we get out and we quickly get changed. And he's like, I'm calling the cops. And we just spray like cockroaches. And I'm like, I snuck back in the hotel, Walked past one of my bandmates who was in the bar. I'm sopping wet. He didn't see me. I'm like, cool. I got away with it. The next day, after sound check, we're in the dressing room and the guys come in and management come in. The tour manager comes in and they're like, AJ, can we have a chat with you? I'm like, yeah, sure. What's up? Like, um, are you going to tell us about what you did last night? I'm like, I went to eat, AJ. And I'm like, how the fuck did you guys find out? <laughs> and one of the guys was like, dude, you really think the girls you were with are not going to like talk about the fact that they were skinny dipping in, yeah. with you? Yeah. I'm like, no. 
I didn't think they were <laughs> and unfortunately they did. And but I mean, I got banned from a hotel for a year. You didn't have the NDAs handy. No, when you were, <laughs> well, they were kind of soggy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got banned from a hotel in Melbourne, Australia, for uh. a year, um, for being. It was the first and only time a bartender ever cut me off. Really? Um, like literally cut me off. And back then, when I got drunk, my Scottish accent would come out. And I was, thank God this was before the Me Too movement, because I was groping both men waitresses and men waiters oh, with Lord. no shame, sitting at blackjack tables. People were leaving because I was so loud. Um, but, you know, I, had, I, I guess I had done damage to the hotel room too. Like I had set a pillow on fire from my cigarette and like, so got banned for a year, which does bad business for the group because yeah. there's a great venue there and it's one of our biggest markets. Mm. So that didn't go over very well. But we've since been back and uh, ironically at the same hotel. <laughs> and I walk in and it just it gives me the freaking heebie-jeebies. Yeah. I'm like, oh God. Yeah, but do you so, like those memories sometimes that remind you of what could go wrong to keep yeah. you on target? Well, now, now, I do, now I do the playthrough. Like if there's ever a, a brief moment of weakness where I'm like, Man, I could just use a, a fucking sip or something. Yeah. I play it out now. I go, okay, I'll probably finish that bottle. Probably have another. Maybe I'll be done. Then maybe later I'll probably have another couple couple bottles. Then I'm going to probably say I'm going to call my wife and I won't, which means something's up. I'll text her goodnight. She knows right away something's up. I'm not FaceTiming her. Um, I'm supposed to fly home the next day at 10 a.m., Oops, I slept in. I moved my flight to like four in the afternoon so I could sober up. Mm -hmm. Like, then it, then it, but all that happens in like an instant. And then I'm like, nope, I'll take uh, water, please. Yeah. Or I'll take uh, my new thing. I'm back on the Arnold Palmer. <clears throat> oh, I love Arnold oh, Palmer's. I got more, more iced tea than lemonade, though. Yeah. I'm a little, I, I don't like the even. Yeah, no, I, I buy the little the pre-made ones too much. We won't mention who makes it because they don't sponsor the show. No, there you go. Uh, well, Fireball was my last vice. That was my last. Really? That's oh. what took me out. I can do. I was a rum guy. Fireball. Would, Fireball's hangovers are the worst. They though. are. They are the worst. Painful. For sure. Yeah. It's not like a hangover. Like, I, I'm fucked. I'm, no, I need like, a hospital. It's like your head <laughs> is so heavy right here. Mm -hmm. And it's like, because I, I, I never had hangovers when I drank. Um. And I was one of those, like, if I felt sick, I would never throw up. So I'd make myself throw up so I could drink more. Yeah. But fireballs were the worst. Oh, it yeah. was fireball and ginger ale. That was my thing. And when we had our residency in Vegas for two years, that was a rough one for me. Because, you know, I was there for like five days a week. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it got to a point where my wife would say, you know what? Don't even bother coming home on the days off. Just don't, you know, and because it just got bad. And I ended up doing the one thing I swore I would never do in my career, which is perform drunk. And how I got through the show is beyond me. But I was so, I, I kept drinking to try to balance myself out right. literally 30 minutes up to showtime. And I felt pretty good, but our intro to the show was this 35 foot the dissension thing that we one. came down yeah. and once the thing turned i was like oh, 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 oh. Yeah. i'm looking down at people and i'm like there's like 10 of you and like 30 of you oh shit what's the first line i gotta sing what's the first line i gotta sing and how i made it through i don't know I, ironically i think my adrenaline kicked in halfway through and i sobered up quick mm -hmm. but i yeah it, it was it was not it was not my best day Oh, uh, well, I know today I'm living my best day, but uh, right. yeah. it was not my best day. Well, and that's why people that may not understand the one day at a time isn't just about staying sober in that day, but embracing being in the moment and taking in that day and the little nuances, even learning from maybe the shit things that don't go the way we would want yeah. or expect. And I mean, know. that's the thing now, like, you know, all my imperfect, my, my imperfect perfections I've come to terms with. My biggest fear in life well, was failure. I couldn't fail at anything. I hated it. Yeah. Now I'm like, okay, that's part of life. You're not going to be the best at everything. Just do the best you can 
at one thing, but only focus on one thing at a time. I would also take on way too many things. But now I'm seeing every project I have going on all the way through to the end. And it feels fucking great. Like, I'm proud of this. I'm proud of my nail polish line. Like, it's been talked about and it's actually happening. Yeah. Um, you guys will be the first person I'm saying this to. Um, and I can't go into detail, but I have a golf line coming out. Nice. Um, you know, something I've wanted to fucking do for like 25 years. Like yeah. a clothing line, golf balls, clubs, what do you mean? All of the, all the above? All nice. of the above. Nice. Um, you know, and then just, just, just to be like this past year and a half being home with my kids and like really, really just being dad. Like I know a lot of parents that are they're burnt out after the first four months of lockdown. Like get my kid back in school. <laughs> I'm loving it, man. Yeah. I'm loving it. And it's, you know, and my relationship with my wife, honest to God, we've been together 12 years. This last year and a half, it's, it's, it's bittersweet. It's sad, but it's also so positive been the best year and a half of our 12 years together. That's mm. awesome. Period. That's awesome. You know? Where did the passion for nail polish come from? I got to ask because it's... It, it, you know what? Um, it started 20 plus years ago. Um, Steven Tyler is a dear, dear friend of mine. Yeah. Um, well, kind of my godfather, but, you know, unspoken. Mm -hmm. um, Huge Aerosmith fan. And oh, yeah. I started, he was the first person I ever saw wearing nail polish as a man. And I was like, I could do that. Yeah. And it didn't really come in full swing till after I started getting inked. Once I started getting tattoos, I'm like, oh, this all. Then the guy liner came in. I'm like, this is me. This yeah. is who I am. Dyeing my hair all the different colors. And yeah, I mean, yeah. now... <laughs> I've dumbed it down a lot. points at me. I've yeah. dumbed it down a lot. I can't do the hair color thing anymore, but uh, but the nail polish is thing. Yeah. This is actually one of my colors uh, that we're actually coming out. This is our newest color, named after my grandmother. That's um, this cool. This is uh, Ursula. So I think it was she out. into like uh, turquoise and stuff. That's her or? favorite color. Right on. And like I said before, she was my she was the only like performer in my family, but. Classically trained pianist, jazz musician. Her first performance, she failed to go on stage. She had the worst stage fright, so she never, ever yeah. performed. Aww. So she was living vicariously through me. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody ever forced me to take the path that I chose. I just loved to perform. Yeah. I was an actor before I was ever a singer or a dancer. Mm -hmm. I did the singing and the dancing because of musical theater. Sure. Never in a million years thought I was going to make a living on it. I thought I was going to be an actor. 25 years later, yeah, right? you know, it's been about that long, 28. right? 28, yeah. 28 years later. First album was 94? 96. 96, so right. We started in 93. That's what I thought. So I thought it was early. That's but what I thought. for me, got. I started in 92. So it's been 29 years for me. I helped put the band together. Oh, did you? Yes. I'm the OG original Backstreet Boys. I didn't know that. Yep. I was curious. how did, So how did it come together? Did you kind of just see other... Uh, you know, like you think of like a Motley Crue like story. We heard about this guy that rips it on the guitar and this guy no. that that, or so was it just there people was with a, the... So Lou, Lou Pearlman, who was the entrepreneur that right. put us together, um, there was a thing in Orlando called the Blue Sheet, which was like the classifieds for the entertainment industry. Okay. And in there was a big ad that said, looking for uh, five Caucasian men, uh, pop duo group, a la New Kids on the Block meets Boys to Men. So I had just gotten fired from a TV show because I was too tall. Uh, that was going to be on Nickelodeon, and then ABC picked it up. It was a show called Hi Honey, I'm Home. Mm. And uh, so I get fired from that. I go audition for the Mickey Mouse Club. I get a call back. Don't make the call back. And I'm like, all right, well, what am I, gonna, what, what am I doing now? Yeah. And I was 14, so I saw the ad went to Lou's house, auditioned, got signed on the spot. And then Howie I had seen in a bunch of auditions around town as well as Nick. Howie and I are, are the two Latinos in, in, that are in the group. And Nick, clearly not a Latino. <laughs> um, you know, and I, the, it was so weird. Like I would get sent on these, uh, these, uh, these auditions for like Latin and then I show up and it's a bunch of Nicks. 
And I'm like, of course I'm not going to get the part. Like, what the hell? Like, so I knew Howie from all of that and Nick. So they auditioned first. They both got it. Um, I choreographed the auditions. <laughs> Howie came with his own choreography. Oh, dear God. <laughs> I mean, he was doing the whole, you know, all this shit. Oh, man. But that was the 90s. That was yeah. the thing. Yeah. I mean, fuck, we were all yeah. trying to do the kid and play, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Um, and then we had two other members, um, uh, Charles and Sam. Charles, uh, unfortunately, didn't work out. And went, he actually went to college with Howie. So we had a big dinner one night, and we, we, we nominated Howie to be the one to let him go because none of us could do it. So Charles was out, and then... Sam was still with us. Now we're down to four. Um, uh, Lou's limo driver, his girlfriend worked at Disney with Kevin. Uh, so we, we, we meet Kevin. So now we have Kevin and then Sam. Sam ends up quitting because he wants to be a solo artist. And now we're down to four again. So we're like, we need a fifth. So do we go back and re-audition all the other kids from the very first round or what do we do? Excuse me, so Kevin's like, well, I mean, I can make it easier for y'all. I have a cousin who lives in Kentucky, and, and you know, he's he can sing his ass off. Pretty sure he's got rhythm, he can dance. So he called up his cousin Brian, who was a junior in high school at the time, and he goes to the principal's office, and he's never been to the principal's office, so he's like, what the fuck did I do? And he's like, oh, it's a phone call for you. He's like, hey, it's your cousin, it's Kev. He's like... What, what the hell? You're me <laughs> in school, you're pulling me out of class. Is everything okay? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, 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 I'm in this group, and uh, I think it could be big. Do you want to maybe fly down to Florida and meet everybody and see if this works? That's cool. And April twentieth, nineteen ninety three, was our first performance together, and here we are, twenty eight years later. And that I didn't know they were course. related. Yep, they yeah. are cousins. Oh. Now they do. From Lexington and Louisville. What's the, because uh, you play a couple of instruments, right? I play drums pretty well, uh, piano by ear, guitar by ear. I told myself last year when everything was locked down that I was going to teach myself how to play guitar. Haven't done it yet, but it's coming. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I dabble in a little bit of everything. I just try to pick up, yeah. I picked up the harmonica last year. Nice. Um, so, well, I could see as an Aerosmith fan, that's a... Yeah. Well, know. I was doing a whole country thing solo. You're right. And that's what made me want to pick up the harmonica because I figured if I can't get the guitar right off the bat, at least get the harmonica. Yeah. Um, and then the pandemic hit and I went back to... I'm literally about... I'm about to release my first EP. Um, it's definitely not country. I got out of the country world because... Now that things got lifted, I would have to start back over again. Right. And you really need to be embedded in the Nashville culture to yep. be accepted. They don't care. You could be the most talented singer in the world. If you're not from the South, which I'm from, it doesn't get more South, south than Florida. Florida. Okay? <laughs> we're more South than freaking Nashville. Okay? We're, more, we're even more South than Texas. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a very tight to yeah. the chest group of people yeah so I, I just I decided to go back to what my real passion is which is funk and R&B and soul and right on so yeah, yeah it's it's such an interesting side having worked in rock and pop and country radio and all that of how that culture really is between the you know the management the songwriters and the who they'll work with and yeah. you know it's just it's, I mean you know you better than anyone you've worked you know, your uh, way up a DJ but. named Big D yeah out in Vegas yeah yeah I'm yeah. a boy yeah he was playing on all my country stuff when it started, and then, you know, decided to go the other way. But he's well, such a solid And dude. that's kind of an interesting thing, too, that I think people, you know, they'll go, uh, like, like I told you, big Motley Crue fan, and then people, when Tommy Lee did things that were more hip-hop and... Methods of Mayhem? And, yeah, like, oh, in that I driven... I love that. Yeah, and then people, you know, have something to say. It's like, look, just because an artist does this style of music, you don't think that they enjoy or are influenced by other well, type like, of stuff? Like Dave Grohl is a good friend. And I saw this interview he just did recently with Pharrell. I don't know if you've seen it. Mm -hmm. And he basically says, he goes, look, all of the like guitar licks from Nirvana, even the drums, he's like, I pulled those from like the Gap Band and right. from like the Temptations and like, Stuff you would never think was a Nirvana inspiration at all. Yeah. And then now you look at 
but I'm I'm over the moon at what they're doing now with this whole DGs thing. Have you yeah. seen this? Oh yeah. my god! I haven't. So the B, so it's all covers of Bee Gees records. Okay. Sung by the Foo Fighters. Oh, nice. But they sound like the original record, but a little bit more rock. Right, right. Oh my god, it's phenomenal. Yeah. I am a Bee Gees fan. I get shit for love and disco. Oh, dude, Bee Gees. I'm an Enya fan. <laughs> all right, you dude, fucking take the cake dude, right there. You I won. would be driving down the 101 or down Sunset uh, years ago in my Range Rover, which was 24 inch rims, the whole thing. <laughs> Windows down, sail away, sail away, sail. What's up, y'all? And they're like, window up, window up. What the fuck is with this guy? Because I, I just love the sound. It's, sure. And it's, especially driving in fucking LA traffic, I want soothing music. Right. I don't want aggressive music. We you were know, just like, talking it, about that. We were at some restaurant where it was a very calm setting, but the music was like, and I'm like, this isn't the right yeah, music no. for where we're at. We need some Enya. I literally just said yeah, that. Had a, like, like fucking like, Too Short Getting It comes out. Oh, and you're like, like, yeah, Getting It. I feel like this is a nice restaurant, good. but the DJ's not quite Getting It. You yeah, know what? Like, yeah, it's all right. It's a yin yang thing, but it's it's wrong. Yeah. Which, which is weird because you had the the... the like the crowd that was there, you even had at one point like families with their kids that maybe just left and Too Short comes on. Oh, it's yeah. like, and it's not the edited version no, either. I'm you sure. know? So it's Too like, Short was actually part of my bowling league. <laughs> what uh, the fuck? Yeah, uh, and he's a fucking good bowler. <laughs> like ridiculous good bowler. Yeah, it, uh -huh. was, uh, it was a bunch of, so uh, a couple of producer friends of mine, uh, they have a production team called The Jam. And they're good friends, as as well as I am now with Nick uh, Cannon. So all the, all, Wild so all the Wild and Out <laughs> crew, yeah, yeah. we would st we started this bowling league. And then the first night, I'm like, "Is that too short? Like what?" And nicest guy in the world. Right. And I can't think of his real name, but it's like very Something, yeah. You I can't know. remember. Very like. It's kind of like Vanilla Ice, Robert Van Winkle. Yeah, it's like, like it's something in it's, that it's, world. It's like Terrence. Yeah, it's like whatever. Terrence, it's like Theodore. <laughs> yeah, right. But dude gets up, palms it. He doesn't even put in any fingers in any holes, and he's got the hook just like me. But I mean, like his average has got to be like two twenty. Fuck. And I'm like, okay. And, and and like my guys are going against these guys, but oh, it was so much fun. So how was so. Nick Cannon and them? Are they all good? I love Wild and Out. Emmanuel nicest, Hudson is my fucking favorite. Yeah, I, I think mean, that dude is hilarious. Most of the most of the cast that was part of that league, mm -hmm. um, I don't remember hardly any of their names now because it's been like probably seven or eight years. Sure. But nicest bunch of people, yeah. just so down to earth, just a good squad, and we had a blast. Yeah. And like. Even though I don't think anybody was sober, uh -huh. for whatever reason, there was never alcohol at this. Like, because I think yeah, everybody yeah. really was like taking the bowling very seriously. Sure, sure, yeah. Like, because there was like money on the line. Like, yeah, not yeah. a lot of money, but there yeah. was money on you the line. You don't want to lose. So you want to like, win it, no matter exactly. how. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't want anything that's going to like mess up my perception. Sure. Yeah. Of course, my best game ever was a 285. Holy shit! I had bowled 69 games that day, Damn. and I had drank two fifths of Jack Daniels that day. So I could barely see the pins, mm -hmm. but I was so focused at like standing upright, mm -hmm. I just couldn't miss. Yeah, I couldn't miss. I don't remember what my best was. I'm a decent bowler. I don't get out as much as I used to, but I. I, I my family and I just went to Bolero over in Woodland Hills the mm -hmm. other day, and my and my 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 wife knows I'm a good bowler. Yeah. Like my my average is between 185 and 210, mm -hmm. so she knows. My highest score was an 80. But they didn't oil the lanes. So like I'm trying to hook, hook it, it and it's went wah. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. Even with the bumpers up for my kids, <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, yeah. This is embarrassing. Uh, Thank God no one's here. Oh uh, shit. Oh. Uh, well, before we uh, wrap up with some fun ra uh, random questions and leave you with last words of encouragement, uh, we would be remiss being that you have your, uh, we're sponsored by 5150 and you have a group that you mountain bike with called 5150, yes, which I, I dig. I, yeah. I got to hear more about this. Yeah, we, uh, so we picked up mountain biking kind of at the beginning of uh, the lockdown last, last summer. Um, and it started in just the streets. It was just like a street squad with mountain bikes, all e-bikes, because um, most of us are in our 40s and up, so our knees are not what they used to be. And then it became 
small baby trails, then the blue trails, then to black trails, to some double black diamond mm -hmm. trails, to now like, like I know how to take apart my bike, I know what's going on. Um, for my birthday uh, last, this past January, uh, I bought myself what I consider to be the Bentley of bikes, the Trek 9.9 .9 rail. Um, it weighs about 15 pounds lighter than my previous bike, which was a Bulls, uh, which is a German-based company. Um, and now, like every weekend, uh, me and about four to five guys will go and do anywhere from 20 to 30 miles. That's awesome. Um, just the most amazing views. Yeah. And, you know, my brother-in-law is a daredevil. Um, he's 35. He's just, but he's way better than I am. So he's doing like 10 foot gaps. I'm not doing that shit. Like that. <laughs> I, one fall and I'm done. Yeah. Um, but it, it's just, it's been such a great thing to get outside. And then I've been living where I live for six years. Never knew that there's a bike park directly across the street, like with jumps and everything, like full BMX bike park. So I go there like once a week now just to get my jumps better. And right. you're not supposed to bring e-bikes in there, but nobody really monitors it. And I don't think they care. And I'm, I'm not going to the advanced side of the park. Right. I'm doing the intermediate, but it's just so much fun. Yeah. It's so much fun. We got to get you to come out with us once. Fuck yeah. We'll do like a blue trail, which please mild, might be a little rocky downhill, but nothing. I'm crazy. good with that because I'll do trail riding. Like we're up near Sonora and stuff, so I'll do yeah. trail riding. But you're not gonna get me to jump a gap or anything either. Not me either. I'm Plus, I got the Walmart bike. I'm afraid my fucking tire would come off well, on the landing yeah, or well, something. <laughs> you know. Well, what I'll do is I'll let you take out my other e-bike because some of the hills that we do, you're gonna want. You're gonna need an e-bike. I've Trust never me. ridden one. I've never ridden Dude, one. Dude, pedal assist. It's the greatest thing ever made. Once you ride it. You're gonna to want to get one, and you're never gonna like, you're never gonna go analog ever again. You That's gonna be great. Mikey's gonna show up at the house. So you dropped uh, f five grand on what? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, it's it's worth it. It's worth it. Uh, yeah, we can invest. Shit. It. There's yeah. worse things we could spend five grand on. That's absolutely. Very true. Like four bottles of champagne in Russia. Yeah. In <laughs> Russia. Or, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and you know, and as for anyone watching, when we talk about that connecting with nature, getting. Physical activity, here you go, you can throw two in one, mm -hmm. you know? I know for me, I love it like when I hike or get atop a mountain and just yep. be like, because you feel a sense of accomplishment too oh, afterwards, you know? So, yep. rapid questions, Mikey? Yes, and um, so I want to go back to Shit's Creek for a second because okay. I love that show. Okay. Um, my favorite was when Moira needed the pic. She wanted to find the naked picture of herself. And yes. she asked David to help her. And he said, okay, well, that's something I never thought I'd hear without having a gun pointed at my head. <laughs> I thought that was fucking hilarious. Yes. So with all that being said, who is your favorite Schitt's Creek character? Um, it's got to be David is number one. Ironically, Roland is like a close second. Really? Roland shit. I just love Chris Elliott. I, I think yeah, no, I Chris too. Elliott. Like, remember the baby hands? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Baby My hands. Turn. Did you ever <laughs> did you ever see Cabin Boy with oh, him? Yes, where he, where he, he lay, gets laid by the nymph and he's yeah. like, afterwards I will be a cabin man. Yes. And it's just like fucking no, I Chris just, Elliott. Because my my wife, before she got her allergies to stuff, uh, she was a special effects makeup artist, mm -hmm. a beauty makeup artist. Oh, that's awesome. So like she always, every episode that you see Roland, she's like, that is the worst fake gut I've ever seen, but it works. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yes, it does. It does work. I would say my Johnny Rose. Johnny Rose. I love I mean, David, I, but D Johnny yeah. Rose, he's just, I, I love him. Eugene Levy is fantastic. Yeah. Yes. I mean, going back to like Second City TV. Vacation. Vac Chevy yeah. Chase, yeah. Oh, I've, the first one that hooked me was uh, him and John Candy. Um, why am I drawing a blank? They're the uh, security guards. Oh, um, I know what you're talking about. You know about. what I'm talking about, yeah. yeah. But that was when all the Second City TV guys were doing stuff together. Right. Because like, you had like the McKenzie brothers with Rick Moranis. Yep. Eugene Levy was part of that. John Candy was part of that. And uh, I mean, classics like The Great yeah. Outdoors. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, with the... Sketch with, comedy was with really... With the old 96er. <laughs> oh, man. Sketch comedy was definitely a big thing for me as a kid that got me into acting like third oh, and fourth I, grade. I, I mean, that, Mad TV, Living Color, all that stuff yeah. was just such a good 
Yeah, I went to a taping for one of the last Mad TVs because I had interviewed Bobby Lee on uh, radio as his last interview for the day, and it was supposed to be 10 minutes fucking talk to me for like an hour. He's like, you're the only person who knew who the fuck I was. I'm like, dude, I'm a huge fan. He's oh, like, yeah, you he's know. awesome. Come Mad down TV. for, for a recording. Every Saturday at 11. I could not wait for it to come on when I yep. was younger. Could yeah. not wait. Yeah, I mean, when my wife and I flew back from our honeymoon, um, I'm drawing a blank on the actress's name, but she plays Lois. She was Mrs. Kwan. Oh, right. yeah. Um, um, uh, Looking at her face. Yeah, uh, she was Alex, sitting, Alex Borstein. Yeah, yes. she was sitting next to me and my wife. Like, so it was my, me and my wife and then Alex. And my wife had second degree burns from sun poisoning. Oh, shit. From uh, Bora Bora. And like, Alex just like kept talking her off the ledge and like trying to make her feel better. I was like, this is the coolest thing. Never putting two and two together that that's Lois. Right. And I'm like, because I knew her as Mrs. Watt. Sure. So, she didn't look at you and go, oh, Peter. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you guys knew, did you ever do, uh, Backstreet ever do SNL? We did an SNL three times? Three times. Um, we did it back our first time. Um, uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar was the host, Buffy. Mm. Um, and we did two performances, and one of which was acapella. Then we went back and did it a second time. Um, I forgot who the host was. And then we did it a third time. Um, and then Howie and I went, just him and I with our wives, to the SNL 40th. Oh, Which nice. was phenomenal. Hell it yeah. was one of the greatest nights of my wife's life. Um, she's the biggest Beatles fan. Oh. And to be as close as we are to Paul McCartney made her world. That yeah. would have been incredible. Made her world. We I was have... going to introduce myself, because I never met mm -hmm. Sir Paul McCartney. But him and his wife were a little tipsy, and she was dancing for him, and he was dancing for her. Sure. So I was like, you know what? Let them have yeah. it. Home. That would be incredible. Paul McCartney, man. Yeah. I just... We had Chris uh, Farley's brother Tom on, and he told us a great story about introducing himself to, oh, to Paul McCartney. It's fucking hilarious. We'll have to share it with you some other he time. He went up to Paul McCartney, and he said, you know... Being on Saturday Night Live is really going to make your career. Nice. <laughs> yeah. nice. Might just Sir work Paul out McCartney. Like, he looked at him like, get the fuck yes, out of here, dude. Well, <laughs> yeah, right? like, Words of wisdom. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, another random question. Uh, 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 so, your uh, life story gets made into a movie. Who do you see playing you? Um, You're one of the guys who could do it yourself, though. You're like, hey, you got yeah, a Prince I Eminem, mean, like, you I could. could, but ironically, we're, we just started talking amongst us as a group about potentially doing something like that down the road at some point, doing a biopic. Us not being in it, but being the producers yeah, yeah, sure. and telling our story. Um, God, who would I get? Um, I mean, I would love John Krasinski, but he's he's, he's significantly taller. <laughs> um, I don't know, man. That's a that, that's a tough one. The like, only person I could see casting as is, is, is Lou would have been, but he's passed. It would have been uh, Seymour Hoffman. Would have been great to play well, that. Well, yeah. Role. Well, there was talk of actually Toby, the actor Toby. Can't think of his last name. He was um, in the first Avenger. Okay. In Captain America, the first Avenger, he was the, the scientist that worked alongside of Red Skull. Gotcha. Okay. He was yeah, yeah. supposed to play Lou in a, uh, like an A&E lifetime, lifetime something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he actually kind of looked like him a little yeah. bit. Yeah. He was wear a fat suit and everything. God, I don't know who, I, who would play me. You know? I, yeah, I can't. It's like I'm trying to picture people that look like me. <laughs> right. And I'm like, I can't think of anybody that looks like me. Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that one. All right, sounds good. Shoot right. me a text, huh? If you were on a deserted island and you could take one album and one movie, what would it be? A uh, movie would be Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm. Album would be... Oh, um, I know it's weird, but the full Monty soundtrack. Really? What was I, on that? I oh, haven't, so don't remember. So many good songs. But my favorite was, um, You can leave your hat on. Not the original, but the, um, the remake by um, yeah. Tom Jones. Oh, okay. I was like, I don't even remember most yeah, of that I can just do soundtrack. a little strip, you know, strip tease by myself on, a, <laughs> right. on, a, on an island. You're alone. So uh, by myself. You know, who cares? So, you know, yeah. Uh, the fish running away. <laughs> Pet peeves. 
Shit that just irks you. Um, Uggs with shorts. <laughs> I fucking hate that. It's the dumbest thing. When, when I used to live in Malibu, I saw it all the time when it started getting cooler. Right. And I'm like, I, why? You look like an idiot. I just think of like, Jason Siegel, and I love you, man. Yeah, he had but that like, Uggs like, yeah. are wintertime. Shorts are summer, spring. Why are you in Uggs and shorts? That drives me nuts. Um, and... Oh, there's another one. Um, oh, animals dressed as humans. <laughs> that that freaks me out. So like your pets, we ain't never gonna see them. Like wearing like, just pants. Like, because I, 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 I'm, I'm such a huge animal lover. Oh, I me too. I yeah. feel bad sure. for these animals. Like, you know, before my my uh, dog passed years ago for uh, Halloween, we I dressed him up like a like a giant hot dog. He was an uh, Australian Shepherd. Uh-huh. And within the first five seconds, he was just not amused. I'm like, fucking no, fuck over I, I just can't do it to you, Oz. I'm sorry, bro. That's the yeah. same with my dog. I put a sweatshirt on her when it's cold, and she just freezes up and like just looks at me and won't move. And I'm like, okay, take yeah, it. But yeah, your we'll dog's a inside. chihuahua. So everything. I'm obsessed her. with my yeah. dog. She's a rescue. I love animals as well, so I, I get you. Yeah. I get what you're yeah. saying. But yeah, I can't do the sweater. We'll just stay inside. Animals dressed as humans is weird. She avoids yeah. grass anyways. Well, I took go. her to a dog park once, and she was just treading on the cement part. Yep. Would not touch grass. They like to prance. Chihuahuas do. Yeah. One more She's got we, class. She does have <laughs> class. She is a cute dog. One more before we give AJ the final words okay, of encouragement. Okay, one more, one more. When you're stuck in traffic, what's what kind of stuff goes through your head? What what kind of thoughts you got when you're stuck? Um, am I going to be late? Yeah. Even though I I always leave way with enough time to get mm-hmm. where I'm going, but I still worry. Sure. Um, and for whatever reason, lately. And for the first time, I actually stopped. I was with my family. Um, this happened just a few days ago. Um, on the 101, just right by Calabasas, there was like 10 cars on the side of the road. And there was this gap on the side where the metal grating opened up. And it wasn't broken. It just was like not connected. And I was like, fuck, did somebody go off into the ravine? So I said, fuck, I'm, I'm going to stop. Mm-hmm. So we stopped and I got out and sure enough, there was a car all the way down the ravine, sideways, oh, wedged shit. between the fence and a tree. Oh, wow. Now, the woman and her son, I'm assuming, were out of the car. They were shaken up and whatever. Mm. The cop showed up and said, look, if you didn't see what happened, I'm going to ask you, please go, go on your way. But I've always, I, like, I'm always going through my head when I'm driving. Like, if I see an accident, would I stop? Mm-hmm. And like, or like a burning car. Would I put my life at risk to to to, to save someone? And the answer is yes. Mm-hmm. Even though I'm a, I'm a father, and it's like, but in that moment, like I think that just the knee jerk reaction, because I would never forgive myself if I just drove. Just the kind of person you are too. I would drive by, and then you read about it on the news. Oh, there's three yeah. fatalities. God, I wish someone was there. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was there, and I didn't stop. Like yeah. that would kill me. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, I hear you. Well, AJ, we like to uh, leave the guests with uh, any last words of encouragement, people struggling, maybe it's addiction, uh, mental health, usually they, they obviously go hand in hand, um, or maybe for a loved one or just something, throw out some love to people. Um, there's two things I'll say. One, I just got tattooed on my arm, uh, which was a proverb that was, uh, I believe it's a Chinese proverb, um, which is true victory is victory over oneself. Um, when we finally get to be comfortable in our own skin and we finally battle the demons in, inside, we can take on whatever's coming at us from the outside. Um, and the other one I first learned when I first got into the rooms of AA was the only way around is through. Um, you know, don't beat around the bush. You got to go through the happiness, the pain, the ups, yeah. the downs to get to the other side. You have to. Um, you know, I've tried to do the cliff note version and it's failed miserably every time. So no more of the cliff note version. I'm going through it. I got good days and bad days, but today is a great day. So. Hell yeah. Thanks, man. This has been a real pleasure. My pleasure.